you'd um, you'd mentioned earlier on talk, talking about Panksep and um, and the various uh, uh, affective uh, systems. You'd, and you'd mentioned, well, this could be seen as, as a, um, a criticism or challenge to traditional psychoanalytic thinkings of the drive. And, um, you know, you've been able to foreground for us so many places where uh, Lacanian theorization seems to have been useful. But I'm wondering, what are some of the challenges that, that neuroscience might have to Lacanian conceptualizations? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's a, that's a tough question, and it's very much a sort of open-ended question. Um, and there's so much of Lacanian theory, right? So you 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 know, you could, it seems that that maybe there's many facets of Lacan to, that one could draw on to say, well, this is how it illuminates some of what we're finding. But have you had that sense that there may be certain facets of Lacanian theory that don't seem to hold up all that well, or that might be in some ways? Uh, implicitly critiqued by some of the predominant findings in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think I, I think in general, at least as I've been you know, studying and working in this field, that there's more insights from Lacan to neuroscience, I think, than from neuroscience to Lacan. But that's also to say because, um, uh, like I said, you need some psychological understanding of the brain mm. to be even thinking the brain in any, any semi-psychological sense, so that in a sense you need some framework and then how do you then, it's a major question, how do you then move from that brain framework to then critique the psychological framework, which was already giving you the understanding that you use to understand the brain in the first place. So th this is a major argument that comes up in neuropsychoanalysis. Um, but I think that in terms of particular dimensions, you know, the, the the idea of, for example, attachment, you know, it's uh, attachment is usually sort of dismissed by Lacanians as, you know, that's a problem of instinct, you know, that's a problem of, you know, yeah, there's some instinctual process, but no, you know, we psychoanalysts are concerned with drive, you know, we're concerned with the chubissance. Um, and I think that in a way, when you do the neuroscientific studying and really look at it, there is no clean division between a drive and a quote unquote instinct. Um, you know, I, I said before, you know, the instinct doesn't exist, but I think that 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 argument has to be taken for its implications for both neuroscience and for psychoanalysis, that uh, a psychoanalytic theory which relies on a differentiation between drive and instinct, I, do, I don't think is tenable anymore. I don't think that um, in terms of doing the due justice to the neuroscientific findings in their, in their rigor, I don't think you can cleanly say that there's a, there's a drive and an instinct, even if you're making the argument that drive is not purely bodily, that it's somehow indexed by the sociocultural world. Well, instincts are too, you know, in terms of how the instinct goes about engaging with the world is shaped by the individual social sociocultural experience. And the way that say an attachment need might be felt in the way that need is associated with different things, that too is indexed to the subject's individual social history. So I, I don't think, so on the one hand, it's sort of a general level. I don't think that um, it's, I don't think it's um, doing the good scientific work of um, uh, being aware of what is the most up-to-date notion of an instinct that you, you can't build an argument off of that. Um, I, I think another argument um, to be made in terms of you know, the, the fact of the matter being that changes at the biological level and things that impact the subject's biology have very, very real psychodynamic effects. Um, uh, that it, you, you, in terms of, again, arguments that try to get rid of um, the brain or to say, okay, yes, there's the brain, but, you know, it's a matter of how it's subjectivized. You know, it's a matter of how does the individual experience the brain almost as if there's a difference between that there can be an individual without the brain. I, I don't think that's possible. Um, uh, where, um, and you know, Eric Laurent of the um, uh, 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 Lacanian psychoanalyst, he makes this argument too, actually. There's a paper he has on psychopharmacology and jouissance, and he points out that, you know, patients who are on psychiatric medications, which are the majority of clinical patients these days, you know, how, what percentage of the population is on some type of either prescribed or recreational um, uh, psychotropic substance. These, um, uh, uh, subs these um, psychiatric medications, these drugs, they impact of the very basic affective command system that Penksup talks about. And these systems shape the very way the different 
um, uh, um, uh, uh, neurocognitive um, structures are processed, how the individual goes, goes about in the world. You know, someone, to take the very simple example, someone who is on cocaine behaves very differently from someone who is on opiates. There's a totally different presentation, which I don't think you can um, reliably reduce to simply saying that, oh, you know, there's a difference of their symbolic structure between the two. No, no, no. There's the, you know, the drug is doing something. And I think that it's not to reduce and to then say, oh, well, we can explain all of it by simply saying they're on cocaine or to say that, oh, you know, they have too much you know, serotonin, you know, the, the depression serotonin hypothesis that, you know, oh, you need to therefore counter medicate to, you know, balance it out. It's not to make that argument, but it's to say that these different systems suppose different dimensions of affect and they suppose different dimensions of excitation which impact the individual in different ways. And therefore, for a Lacanian concept like jouissance, which is more or less in, in terms of, you know, Lacanians might not always talk about emotions, but jouissance. And, you know, it usually appears as anxiety, you know, sort of converts into anxiety, you know, a pleasure or an enjoyment, which isn't felt as such, it is felt instead as anxiety. I think that at the same time, we, we can't just think jouissance as a unitary concept, or at least we can't think of all of jouissance as itself a whole, that at least the different dimensions of jouissance, you know, the obsessional who gets the little repetition, repetitive pleasure in the compulsion versus the overwhelming bodily jouissance of, you know, a, 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 a disorganized schizophrenia, you know. In psychoanalysis, the same term might get used, but I think these are very different um, when we think about it from a neuroscientific level. And it's not to replace the concept, it's to say that this concept needs more thinking. I can't take any ideas from neuroscience to replace that thinking and to give you the thinking that you need. But on the analytic end, this has to be rethought. And this is an area for future research. It's an area for future clinical thinking. Um, so maybe not in the sense of necessarily directly challenging things in the sense of correcting it, but challenging it where this is the limit of the current knowledge that's been generated. And this is where you need to start thinking to keep pushing beyond that to come up with a more rigorous model of the subject. Um, it, it's it's interesting that you you use the example of jouissance because well for two reasons one I was going to ask you about jouissance um, and also that argument that you make that increasingly it will be difficult within perhaps the Lacanian world to simply think of jouissance as a unitary phenomena um, is an argument that that's starting to emerge also you know in in, in the more I suppose theoretical literature because it, it does seem to be a somewhat overused concept and it's so many times I've thought you know it, it would be useful to be far more qualifying in in terms of, of how one utilizes that concept to do certain kinds of explanatory work so in a way it's it's um it's nice to hear that this is something that that um, is coming to the fore in neuroscience as well uh, the other thought that came to mind actually it was a bit of a silly thought but um you know poor old Strachey is always um uh, critiqued because he always systematically in the standard edition says instinct instead of drive. And I was just thinking, well, maybe this is a little message from the future back to the past to tell him, hey, dude, maybe you're okay, actually. Um, John says that this is no longer a, a tenable distinction between instinct and drive, so we're going to let you off the hook. So we're sending a message back to the past to, to James Strachey. 